Have you been prepared for battle? Or are you in comfort mode? How many of you got dressed this morning? Don't ask a silly question. You all dressed. But how many of you put your armor on this morning? How many of you just think, what's he talking about? You know, we to put our armor on every day. It's something that we're to use. And I'm convinced this morning that um, as we go through this particular section, looking at the lessons from um, Moses and the people of Israel, that we are ignorant of being involved in a spiritual battle. We're ignorant of being involved in spiritual warfare. Let me ask you, how many of you have understand what spiritual warfare is? Or is it just a figment of your imagination? To some, some people, spiritual warfare is simply your imagination working overtime. But we're involved in spiritual warfare every day. Every day, it's happening. Now, just as in real warfare battles, they're fought in different fronts for different reasons with varying degrees of intensity. And the same is true in spiritual warfare. They're real battles. Even though we cannot physically see our attacker, we need to educate ourselves regarding our enemy and his tactics and how he uses, how these battles are to be fought and how they actually affect our lives every day. Now just because we're Christians, it doesn't mean that we're immune from being attacked by the enemy. It just doesn't mean that, hey, voila, bang, you're protected for the rest of your life. It's not going to happen. And so spiritual warfare, if we do the next one, I don't know why it's not moving, but if we, there we go. It's spiritual warfare. Now, what is spiritual warfare? As a Christian, if I'm involved in it, what is it? It's being attacked by the enemy, but what do you do if you're engaged with the enemy? Well, you put your armor on, but spiritual warfare is resisting, it's overcoming and defeating the lies of the enemy. And those forms will come in the form of deception, through temptations and through accusations that are sent as arrows to infiltrate our minds and affect our thinking. You see, it begins up here with the mind. Any thought that can be projected, it starts here. And I came across this quote by a lady in her book. She's called it the armor of God. She says this, we tend to see our problems and struggles as not being spiritual. So we do not look for spiritual solutions to solve them. Everything that occurs in the visible, physical world is directly connected to the wrestling match being waged in the invisible spiritual world. The effects of the war going on in the unseen world reveal themselves through our strained and damaged relationships, our emotional instability, our mental fatigue, physical exhaustion, and many other areas of life. Many of us feel pinned down by anger, unforgiveness, pride, comparisons, insecurity, discord, fear, and we can go on and on. But the overarching primary nemesis behind all these outcomes is the devil himself. We're in a battle and we need to prepare ourselves on how we can resist the lies and the deception of our enemy. And we're going to learn from Moses. This will not just be a once-off battle. It's something that continues on every day. We have an unseen enemy who will persistently dog our lives while ever we have breath in our, 
in our bodies. He's always there. He's always ready. He's always wanting to do something. We then see the struggle of warfare. And warfare is a struggle. There's no two ways about it. It's a struggle. And so many times in the book of Exodus, we find that God is revealing himself and he's made himself known first to Moses and to Aaron. He's made himself known to Pharaoh and the Egyptians and he's been making himself known to the children of Israel. The nation of Israel had been on a journey to the promised land and God has been showing them in no uncertain terms who he is. And he's trying to teach them that they can trust him that he'll do everything he says he will. It's not just a matter of words with God. If he says he's going to do something, believe me, he will do it. But he's taking them on this journey. And this journey is all about the nitty gritty of everyday living. It's not a spectacular pleasure thing that you go for four days and everything's provided. No, it's a nitty gritty. It's in the wilderness. It's in the desert. And it's everyday living. And it's teaching them to stand firm on the principles and promises of his word. And those principles and promises really come down to the issue. Can I trust that God is big enough and able enough to do everything he says? That's what it comes down to. Do I trust that God can do it? Will he do it? As a people, they had been delivered out of Egypt. They thought it was wonderful. And of course on their journey they had a few cases of mumbling and grumbling and groaning and moaning and everything else and God had taken care of them. They'd stopped at a place, uh, uh, arrived here at Rephidim and as they've arrived here they're about to face the first opposition from an outside source. This was from outside. All their other battles had come from within. Remember they were grumbling because there's no food. They wish they were back in Egypt with the melons and the leeks and everything else. Um, they had no water, so they grumbled, they complained against Moses. They grumbled about being taken out of their comfort zone. You know, we all got our comfort zones, those places where we feel comfortable and secure. And sometimes God's got to pry us out of that comfort zone before he can do anything with us. Now God had been compassionate, he'd been understanding, he was prepared to teach them through great patience who he really was. In our text, the people of Israel were going to learn that everyone is not happy as a group of people. Now, what I mean by that is, here they are, they're set out on their journey on the promised land. And they're going through other through this land and there are other nations that are there and they're not happy to see this large group and we're talking about two million plus people traipsing through their territory using their resources using their water etc and they're not happy about it and they were not going to sit back and do anything they were going to do something about these people who were trespassing as far as they were concerned and were not welcome in their territory. And the people of God are about to learn a lesson of preparation. They were going to learn to trust God. But they were going to be, get a reality check in that they were expected, expected to engage in battle with an enemy who doesn't play by the rules. Here, this enemy uses guerrilla warfare tactics. And the idea is to confuse and divide the people. So they had to fight them without much experience and knowledge when it came to warfare. Now, spiritual warfare is a very different sort of warfare. The children of Israel were not warriors. They had not been trained in the art of warfare. They were slaves. And what does a slave do? 
work. He's told when to get up. He's told how long he has to work. And he's told when he can go home. Life's pretty, well, it's tough, but you know what you're going to do. Here, they're out in the middle of nowhere going to fight an enemy who was well-versed in warfare and they were supposed to be prepared to take them on in battle. That's why I say spiritual warfare is a struggle. It's not something we give much thought of and yet every day you and I are engaged with an unseen enemy. Sometimes the attacks are intense, other times they're light, they're like a little skirmish and we're easily able to deal with them. But sometimes those attacks are brutal and drives us to our knees. They wear us out and there doesn't seem to be any relief in sight or any lessening of the intensity. What are we to do and where do we turn? And often I will get requests or phone calls, Pastor, I can't take it anymore. I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm worn out. What do you give as an encouragement to brothers and sisters who are in this situation? When their heads are ringing with voices talking to them, accusing them, telling them all sorts of things in their minds. No, you don't tell them to go to mental health. Mental health won't help them. What do you do? You see, this is something that it's new to many people. This was new to the children of Israel. Spiritual warfare? Oh, really? I've never picked up a sword in my life. How would I know how to fight? Yet you tell me, Pastor, there's a devil. I can't see him. I don't know what he's like. Well, the Bible reveals what he's like. He's real. But he deceive you into thinking, no, it's all up here. It doesn't exist. It's a myth. People look at you strange. Now let's look at the enemy in verse 8. In verse 8, we're told, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Now the children of Israel came out of, Il out of Egypt as children of God. Yet in that journey they were going to face many enemies to the promised land. And you know what? Not everything was going to be fine. Not everything was going to be sweet and trouble free. It wasn't going to happen. But they didn't know that. This would be their first engagement with an enemy called the Amalekites. And you know what? This was their first battle. And to make things worse, they were related by blood as the descendants of Esau. They were related. They were their own kin. And they were going to fight them. Now I guess the question would be, as we're thinking about this, why on earth would God allow his people to face opposition from their own kinsmen. Why would he do that? I mean, we're related. Why would he allow them to fight us? And why would we have to fight them? And I think, I believe it was God was to teach them the basic principles of spiritual warfare to enable them to look back on this encounter and learn from the experience they had now in how they would confront and deal in future battles against an enemy such as this one. This was preparing them for the future. But attacks come in all shapes and sizes from different directions from people that you wouldn't think would happen. They wouldn't have thought it would come from their own relations or descendants. Now we know from studying the Bible that the Amalekites were always doing their level best to oppose Israel. Everything that they did, they made it their life's mission 
to make life as difficult as possible for Israel wherever they found them. There was a hatred that was there. Now understanding a principle here, for the Israelites this would be their first real battle but it wouldn't be their last one. This enemy would be persistent and a thorn in their side throughout their journey through the promised land and even beyond. So he's not going to go away. He's going to come back and back and back. This was just the first encounter. This is something that you and I need to be reminded of in the battles that we face. They're not once-offs. They will hit us from every side. They will use outside circumstances and situations. And they will hit from within, testing and tempting our attitudes and our appetites of our flesh and our mind in order to distract us from achieving our goals. Our, God's, our enemy's purpose is in the direct opposition of God and everything he stands for. That's what the enemy is. He opposes and stands against everything that God is and stands for. And anyone who follows God, you're a target. You've got special attention coming your way, whether you like it or not. The Amalekites had adopted the attitude of Esau and the conflict he had with Jacob. And this has continued between Israel and the Amalekites even to this day. God had promised Jacob that Israel would inherit and inhabit the land of Cana. It would become their land and now God was leading them to achieve this very thing. But you know what? The Amalekites were not going to have a bar of this. No way. They were determined not to allow Israel to have any part of Canaan. And if they could help it, they violently not just slightly, but violently opposed Israel. And in effect, they were directly opposing God and saying to God, stop us if you can. Stop us if you can. Now, we're not facing Amalekites in a physical sense, but what are our enemies that we face every day? The Bible tells us the world, the flesh, and the devil. And their purpose is in direct opposition to God. And he and those enemies have one goal in mind, to destroy or distract us from serving God. That's their sole purpose. The enemies of God don't play by the Queensbury rules of warfare. And by that I mean in which both sides come together and agree this is how we're going to do this. You know, if I slap you, you can slap me. If I slap you, you slap this. If we reach the point and go like this, then we stop. That's a conducted warfare where the rules of engagement are observed. Our enemy doesn't play by those rules. Our text clearly identifies the Amalekites didn't engage in a full frontal attack. In other words... It's like having a sign, I'm an Amalekite, I'm here, I'm going to fight you. Yeah, right, I'm ready for you, I can see you. They didn't play that sort of game. They engaged in guerrilla tactics, sneak attacks, designed to catch their foes at their weakest and most vulnerable points and exploit them for all they were. Now, they would patiently wait to strike when they believed they could inflict the most damage without incurring any casualties or very few casualties among themselves. Now Deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 17 and 18 says this, Remember what the Amalekites did to you on your way from Egypt, how they met you along the way and cut off your stragglers in the rear of the march when you were exhausted and tired and they were unafraid of God. So when the Lord your God gives you relief from all the enemies who surround you in the land, he's giving you as an inheritance you must wipe out the memory of the Malachites from under heaven. Don't forget. So who did the enemy attack? What was their tactic? They would wait until the stragglers came. They would wait 
where everybody was tired, where everybody was thirsty, where everybody's hungry. And they would go to the back of the line. And as they went to the back of the line, who would they find at the back? They would find the most vulnerable, women, children, the elderly. And that's who they attacked. They didn't take the front guys on, where probably all the soldiers were, or all the men who could fight. They went to the back and they attack from the back. The weakest points to exploit those who were the most vulnerable, that's where they attacked. But they waited until everybody was tired and exhausted, not when everyone's feeling sprite and ready to take on the world. No, wait until everybody's tired. And the principle for a believer is this. The enemy will not attack you when you're ready. The enemy will not attack you when you're strong and aware of his attacks. No, he's going to wait until you're weak, until you're exhausted and weary, when you're at your most vulnerable, and he will exploit the weakness that he finds for all it's worth. And make no mistake, the enemy's constantly looking for our weaknesses, something to make us vulnerable, something that he can exploit. And make no mistake, he will find it and use it against us when we least expect it. Now, our enemy is determined. He's not going to give up on his attacks on us. There may be a little bit of a truce for a little while, but he's looking for any way he can bring us down and distract us from our walk with God. Israel had this first encounter with the Amalekites, but it's not going to be the last one. You know, in Deuteronomy, God said, do not forget the Amalekites. Don't forget. Learn this lesson here. This is the first battle. And he's saying to them, remember what takes place here. Remember this prepares you for the future battles of what you must do. And they did go on to win this battle. Now I'm giving you an insight. They won this battle. But they lost a few others along the way. And you know why? They forgot what they'd learned here. They had forgot the lesson that they learned here. The Amalekites' life mission was built on hatred. And they vowed never to rest until every Israelite was destroyed. So they were constantly harassing, constantly opposing Israel. And if they found them, they would strike them when they were least prepared. This is something for us to understand. You and I are engaged in spiritual warfare with an enemy who's relentless, an enemy who's ruthless, an enemy who wants to destroy us. He'll use whatever tactics. And he's not going to wait while you're strong while you're alert, he's going to get you when you're down. And he'll use whatever means to get to you. And it starts up here in the mind. Those fiery darts, those thoughts that come in, that's where he starts his warfare. Now, we become the target for special attention. His specialty is more intense scrutiny and pressure to be applied to a Christian until a breaking point is reached. He wants to break us down. Now what happens is those attacks will intensify to the point where we feel we can't go on anymore. We are worn down. Now I like another principle is that if he's not successful in hitting us with a Mack truck encounter, then he will target our families and exploit and use circumstances in their lives to bring us down. Now, if you've ever been hit by a Mack truck, is there anybody here that has? It's not a nice experience. It's pretty heavy. And you know the connotations of that is. You feel as though you've been rolled over and pummeled, and you don't feel as though you can get up. But you do get up, and you go on. And what the enemy says, okay, strong yeah I like that what he does then is target your family 
He targets your friends and he will use them to get to you. He might even target our health. Ouch. And he does that. He targets our health. He might target our finances, dry them all up. He uses them as pawns in a game. Now we can be strong, but guess what happens? If your partner, if your wife, if your husband, if a child, all of a sudden, their health comes down and they're giving a, a life sentence which says, you've only got three months to live. What effect does that have on you? What do you want to do? How are you going to deal with it? All these thoughts that take place and that's how he attacks the mind. That's how he gets us to say, well, if God is so good and God's looking after my interest, why doesn't he do something? You see, that's the seed thought that's planted. If God is so good, what's he doing? Is he up on a holiday somewhere and leaving you on your own? That's the accusations, that's the deceptions to get you to prove God doesn't care about you. And you know, our minds do the rest of it. He just intensifies those attacks to break down the resilience and the resistance. You know what? It works. It works. He'll use whatever means possible to attack you. And we're not even aware of it. But it's a weapon that he uses and he's used effectively over the years. Now we go to the enlistment. Well, maybe we will. You'll have to... The enlistment in verse 9a. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. I'm almost certain that if you were to ask Joshua or Moses... Did they really want to get into any kind of battle with the Amalekites? What do you think they would have said? I'm sure they would have said, no, let's consider our options. What can we do? Because Moses wasn't silly. He knew and understood that the people were not fighters. He knew that the Amalekites, this is their way of life. This is what they were used to. This is how they operated. And so they were coming against an enemy. Now, I'm sure they would have tried to, well, not provoke the Amalekites. It's like I saw, you get a stick and you poke a bear. What's going to get? You're going to get a response from the bear that you're not going to like. I'm sure they would have want, I was sure they want to remain in a peaceful state, not cause any offence, they just want to be left alone and get on with life. And isn't that what we as Christians want? Just leave us alone. Let us get on with life. Let us be comfortable. We don't want to offend anybody. Let's just do it. Now Moses and Joshua didn't go looking for trouble. And that's the problem. As a believer in Christ, you don't have to go looking for the enemy. The enemy will find you. Or as they say, trouble will find you. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, then trouble will find you. You don't have to go looking for it. The enemy will find you. And um, as much as you want to be peaceful, as much as you want to, uh, the enemy to go away, the battle will come to you whether you like it or not. It really will. Now we're introduced to this fellow called Joshua. He became the next leader after Moses some 40 years later. But right now, if you like, he's the general in charge of an army that he hasn't got. Not bad, is it? Go out and fight them. Yeah, what with? And he's instructed, put together from among the men, an army. Yeah, okay. So no doubt Moses said to Joshua, look Joshua, we've never done this sort of thing before. We've got a few people among us who may have been in a fight or know how to wage warfare. But the people have been slaves and as a slave, well, you just do what you're told. Nevertheless, Joshua, 
See what you can find from among the men and list them in the battle that is to come. And you know what? You've got 24 hours to do it. No pressure. Two million people. Surely I've got to find some blokes that are capable of fighting. Now, if I was Joshua, what do I look for? I've got to enlist an army to fight a well-trained guerrilla uh, tactical side. What do I look for? Well, you're not much help. Okay. First of all, I'd probably be saying, can you walk? Are you strong? How old are you? Do you have a weapon? And if you do, do you know how to use it? Are you willing to fight? No, no, no. You'll have to learn to fight because there's no other options. It would have been a strange thing for this group of people to fight an enemy that they didn't know much about or understand why. It's hard. Why do I have to fight an enemy I don't understand much about? Why is he targeting me? You see, after all, God told them he would be taking them to a land flowing with milk and honey. He promised to fight on their behalf. So why should they have to fight if God's promised to fight on their behalf? Wasn't God capable or big enough to take care of these Amalekites? You see, the prospect of fighting them filled with them a sense of fear and doubt. What can we do against these people? We're slaves. We're farmers, not warriors. We're not fighters. What on earth are we supposed to fight with? It's natural enough to think this way and to reason this way. When they've been pursued by the Egyptians, God didn't tell them, hey, look, you guys, pick up any weapons you could find and fight them. They were simply told, put your faith in God, watch him deliver and destroy your enemies. They didn't have to do anything except exercise their faith in God. God did it all. I wonder how many Christians think the same way. I'm on my way to heaven. Hallelujah. Why should I have to fight? God's promised to get me there. He's promised to be my protector and my deliverer. Why should I have to fight? I'm trusting you, God. Yep, I'm trusting you. There's the enemy. Fix him. And what do we do? What do we do? Sit back and do nothing. That's what the Christian life is about, isn't it? Sitting back and enjoying the ride. Well, I've got news for you. That's not what the Bible talks about, the Christian life. It's not a matter of letting go and let God do his thing and just go for the ride. There'll be times when God will tell us to cooperate with him, just like he did with Joshua in bringing down the walls of Jericho. They marched and shouted, and the walls came tumbling down, but they followed his instructions. They did something. There'll be other times when God still wants us to stand up and fight and will work through us as his instruments to achieve that very goal. We're part of the instruments that he's going to do to use against the enemy. God did not tell his people when they were slaves in Egypt that if they worked hard enough, then I'll set you free. But you must prove to me that I want, you want it bad enough, so work harder. That wasn't the condition he put them on to say, look, if you work harder, I'll get you out of there. No. When he did free them from Egypt, he didn't say to them, look, I know you worked hard to be free, and I'm going to take care of all your battles from now on because you deserve a rest, just like you had at Elam, under the palm trees, eating dates. Just sit back and enjoy life. Everything will be sweet, and I'll take care of everything. There's nothing for you to worry about at all. I've got it all in hand. 
I'll take care of everything. You won't have a care in the world. You're my special people. Just sit back and enjoy life. Your worries are over, trust me. That's not what God said. And yet, that same expectation is what Christians have of their God today. Let me sit back in this oasis, eating my grapes, eating my dates. You take care of it, Lord. I'm resting. I've worked hard, you know. And of course, when it doesn't happen, what happens? God? Why? You've failed. You've let me down. You haven't kept your word. Why? We believe, we think we deserve to have a trouble-free life simply because we trusted in Jesus Christ. And so because of that, we've handed over all our problems and our cares and we should now enjoy life without troubles and problems. That's not what my Bible teaches me. We're reminded as Christians, we are to do our part and we have to put some effort into walking through this life by faith. Just as the children of Israel were about to learn, it's not a trouble-free life. Romans 8.13 tells us to be putting to death the things of the flesh, what I see, what I hear, what I do. I must be in a state of preparedness to confront what attitudes and actions that are not consistent with who I am. God will not do what I can do and neither should be expected to do. As a child of God, I need to know who I am. I should know what's expected of me. And God expects me to do my bit. He's not going to do what I can do. And I shouldn't expect him to do it. I really shouldn't. I'm told in Ephesians 4 to be constantly putting off the old way of life and putting on new things, embracing them, let them fill the void that was there where the old things have gone. You see, when I became a Christian, the old went out and the new's been replaced with something to fill that void. I'm to be putting off the old way of life. That's something I can do. Now, I don't need my wife to dress me yet. I haven't reached that point of not being able to do it. I'm supposed to do that myself. Now, when we have children, and they're young, we do the dressing. But you know, even two and three years, no, 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 I'll do it. And I'll take it and I'll put it on back to front, but hey, I do it. We know what it's like. And God expects us to do our bit as well. Ephesians 6 tells me to put on the whole armor of God to stand against the walls of the devil. Colossians tells me to put to death the things of the earth that I once knew that I once followed and embraced. This earth is not my home. I'm just passing through. 1 Timothy 6.12 tells me to fight the good fight, never to give up. As long as I've got breath, keep fighting. Be on guard against the attacks of the devil. Luke 13.24 tells me to strive and keep going towards the narrow gate, not to follow the broad gate that leads to destruction, for that is where most people are going. Now, as I look at the children of Israel on this journey, I can see myself among them. I can see myself as one of them. When I experience these attacks, I need to ask myself, what is God trying to teach me? What is the point of these attacks? This is something that I should not be surprised about when it happens to me because I'm a child of God. I've often heard Christians say to me, Pastor, these attacks have only gotten worse since I became a Christian. Before that, I never experienced so much pressure. And I'm begin to, beginning to wonder whether being a Christian is such a great thing after all. God has provided us with salvation. And he does meet and provide us with what we need for every day through this journey in life. And there are a lot of things that he wants to teach us before we get to go home. There'll be times when you and I will be hungry, 
times when we'll be tired and thirsty and we might wonder what on earth is God doing and why is he doing this to me and that will set me off to complain and grumble about the things that are happening to me and then I have to realize I'm part of the solution God expects me to do some fighting as well and that thought that's not exactly what I signed up for it's not what I thought was in the brief about being a Christian to fight what is the point of fighting what do I need to fight for is it that I need to prove myself to God and keep in his good books that I have to keep fighting to get his approval and stay there is that what the point of fighting is you see we might not have signed up to fight but this is what God expects of us he's not going to allow us to sit back on our laurels and rest on them he wants to develop our character he wants to develop our obedience and trust and this only goes through learning what is important and what we need to fight for Moses could have been thinking to himself ah, God's got this not a problem he's got it he's already proven himself through the plagues on the Egyptians I'm sure he'll take care of this not a problem but no Moses instructs Joshua you must get up and find some men who are going to get down and get dirty and fight this enemy that's what it means getting down and dirty and fighting the enemy now we see the engagement here in verses 9a and 10 tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered and Moses Aaron and her went up to the top of the hill now most of us have found ourselves sometimes in difficult situations in which we have no control over and there doesn't seem to be any obvious solutions or options available to us so the question is what do we do in these circumstances what do we do who do we turn to Moses knew that war was coming Moses also knew that he was past his prime as a warrior he knew that so he designates this position to Joshua with the instructions to draft every available man to fight I'm sure that Moses and Joshua in the backs of their minds were thinking what is God going to do they'd seen him deal with the Egyptians they'd seen his presence amongst them with the pillar of fire and cloud they had seen food fall from the sky to feed them every day they'd seen water coming from the rock what they had experienced was God's power protection and provision for them on a daily basis so with that in mind why should they be anxious about facing the enemy God certainly hadn't brought them there just to abandon them now so in the backs of their mind they had the theory down pat God's in this I just don't know how he's going to do this but they understood that God had not deserted them now Moses responded to the prospect of battle by preparing the people and himself by instructing the men of Israel that they were under the command of Joshua that they would fight the enemy on the field using swords the next day that's the instructions that were given and there was no mistake about the instructions you will fight the enemy with Joshua as your leader tomorrow down on the fields every one of you that's what you'll do there were no big pardons there's no arguments there's no debates this is what you'll do question is where do they get the swords anyone got any idea I mean they came out as slaves where would they get their swords well it's thought that basically they got their swords from when they crossed the Red Sea when the Egyptians who were following 
after them uh, washed up on the beach and they collected the swords. They took them with them and collected them for use. Now I have no doubts Moses and Joshua understood their men were very inexperienced. They were no match for the Amalekites because the Amalekites, this was their way of life. This is what they did all the time. God had a plan for his people and this included his people having to do some fighting against this enemy. And I'll say this in all sincerity. It applies to us as we walk with God. We're not immune from attacks from the devil. We are to take the field in the battle. There are decisions that we must make. We must pick up our swords and be ready to use them against the enemy. Now what is the sword for the Christian that he's to take up or she's to take up? The word of God. Take up the word of God. Take up the sword of the spirit. You know what I find really interesting is that we can be enlisted and told ready to fight but most of us don't pick up the sword of the spirit. We don't know how to use the sword. We don't use it as a weapon. And yet, this is our weapon. Why? It instructs us in what we're to do, in who we are. It instructs us about God. This is our foundation of our faith, and most of the time we don't look at it or use it. I dare say that some people, maybe on a Sunday, might open it up then. Well, you can't fight a battle on one day's use. You've got to use what you have for the day. And that's by getting into the word of God. That's standing on those promises and making those promises live for you. That's how God speaks and encourages us and strengthens us in our faith. But we don't use it. We use this against our enemy and it's deadly. But you and I cannot just expect to sit on the sidelines and do nothing while God does everything. It's that expression I like to use, there's no such thing as a free lunch or a free ride. It's not going to happen. We are involved in warfare whether we like it or not. We can't just sit back and vegetate. We must be participants with the Lord and cooperate and use the weapons as instructed. Now Moses didn't b sit back at this huge problem. He's got inexperienced people who don't know how to fight. He has a crafty enemy who this is what they know best. He didn't say, woe is me, what am I to do? Moses had a plan. Moses had a strategy and he knows that he must do what he must do and be confident in doing it. He says, I'll go to the top of the hill. And on that hill, he overlooks the plain. Why does he go to the top of the hill? Because he gives them a good view of where the battle is going to take place. And what will he do while he's standing on top of the hill overlooking that valley? I'll hold up my hands with the staff of God in my hands. That's my strategy. That seems a strange way to fight a battle. One bloke standing on a hill with a staff. What good is that going to do? What a dumb idea. Well, it's dumb if you didn't know what that staff represented. You see, if he held the staff up in his hands, we're told, and stretched it toward the plain, guess what? The strategy would be the Israelites would be winning. But when his hands dropped, it meant the enemy would win. Now, I noticed about Joshua, his general. Joshua didn't say, oh, hang on a minute, Moses. Are you fair dinkum? You're going to go up on top of the hill and you're going to hold out this staff while I'm down there fighting? Uh, really? Uh, what, uh, what sort of a plan is this? 
He didn't argue with Moses about his instructions. He just did what he was asked. We're also going to be introduced to a man named Hur who went up the hill to be a help to Aaron and Moses. Now this fellow Hur wasn't chosen by God to lead Israel out of bondage. He wasn't called to serve him as a high priest or captain of the guard. But you know, he found a place in using what he can do to help God. His position wasn't in the front line, but her, as we're going to find out next week, was happy to be used by the Lord in whatever capacity he could. And God has gifted each one of us differently, but we all have a work to do. We can't all serve in the same position. We can't all be Moses. We can't all be Joshua's. We can't all be Aaron's. You can't all be pastors. You can't all be deacons or elders. We can't all be music directors or Sunday school superintendents. But every one of us is equipped to teach. Every one of us has a voice that we can sing. Some of us are gifted in being able to play an instrument. Every one of us have gifts or talents and abilities that we can use. And when we use them, we find our place just like her found his place to help Moses. The outcome of this situation could have been very different if her was not willing to serve the Lord where he was. As we're going to find out, her didn't have much of a job. Does anyone know what he did? And we'd go into it a great deal next week. He helped Aaron. He got a stone for him to sit on and then he helped hold up Moses arms that's all he did big deal it was a big deal he saw a need he saw that he could do this he jumped in and did it he did it and it made a difference now the outcome of this situation could have been different if her hadn't jumped in and did what he did put him in the place where he had him it takes everyone being in their place of service it takes everyone being faithful in their work to ensure the well-being and prosperity of a church who's going forward for the Lord Jesus Christ we all need to be prepared to serve we all need to be prepared to play our part in spiritual warfare things that happen to us every day now what part can I play? How did Israel win this battle against the Amalekites on this occasion? You'll have to come and find out next week. But what I'm saying is, as a believer, 